Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Lauren Schulman, Professor Emeritus and former Dean of the University at Buffalo School of Social Work, a social work practitioner educator for more than 40 years. He has done extensive research on the core helping skills in social work practice, supervision, child welfare, and school violence. Dr. Shulman has published numerous journal articles on the topic of direct practice and is the author of many books, including Empowerment Series, The Skills of Helping Individuals, Families, Groups, and Communities, The Dynamics and Skills of Group Counseling, and Interactional Supervision, which is now in its fourth edition. Dr. Shulman, welcome to The Therapy Show. Hello, glad to be on it, Bridget. So in our last interview, we discussed supervision best practices. Today, I would like to go deeper and explore the supervisory relationship. You have written a lot about parallel process and how it relates to the supervisor and practitioner relationship. Can you explain what parallel process is? I'd be glad to. One of the things that's influenced my work over the years is that in addition to teaching and doing research, I've continually practiced. So I was leading groups almost right to the time of my retirement from the University of Buffalo School of Social Work. And it became very clear to me that many of the skills that were required for me to be an effective group leader and to work well with clients were the same skills that were required for supervisors. However, what was different and a crucial difference is that supervision is not clinical practice. So what became clear to me again is the need to clearly define the role of the supervisor and the role of the clinician. And then you could attach these skills to those different jobs that they had to do. My research over the years has looked at every level. And when I look at what I call the relationship skill is whether or not, for example, the client or the supervisee feels that they can say anything on their minds to their worker or their supervisor, whether they feel the worker or the supervisor understands them, whether they feel the worker and supervisor are there to support them. So I could go on and on. And what became very clear is that the skills, the interactional skills, the conversation between the person providing help and the person receiving were often strikingly similar. Empathy is empathy. You had to empathize, for example, with a worker and the struggles they had when dealing with a difficult client if you expected that worker to be able to empathize with the client. And it went right up the whole system. In my study in British Columbia, I had five levels. I had executive directors for the entire province. I had managers for regions. I had supervisors who had the district offices, the workers, the parents, and the kids. That's six levels. And what I found in every level was that these same skills at every level were crucial in terms of fulfilling the functional role. So that's for me, anyway, was the beginning of the idea of the parallel process, that the way in which, for example, you supervise someone is going to be reflected in in many cases in the way that person works with their clients. So you can't say, do as I say. What you really have to do is model and demonstrate those skills, but again, in pursuit of your functional role as a supervisor. Because supervisors make a big mistake if they start doing clinical practice on their workers. Does that start to explain a little bit of what I mean, Bridget? That's really important that there's a distinction. Absolutely. How important is understanding parallel process to the success of the relationship between supervisor and practitioner? It's central. I have had examples. I've done a number of books and my new supervision book is coming out and ASW Press is putting it out. It's at the editor right now. So it should be out this fall. And I I use process recordings. I don't know what you have. You are familiar with my work. And anybody who reads anything I write always sees process recordings, the conversation, what was actually said, not just abstract discussion of it. As I've done this over the years, it became very clear to me that I had to make the relationship variable, the center of the work. In other words, the supervisor's relationship with the worker would have an impact on the outcomes of supervision. Now, it wasn't the only thing that had an impact. I mean, supervisees, for example, were impacted by the stress they may have felt in doing their job. Like right now, it's clear as a bell that the stress from the virus is impacting frontline workers. You have to pay some attention to that. Otherwise, you've got a frontline worker trying to help a family coping with internal stress related to the virus, 
when at that very same time, that worker is not getting the help coping with their own issues. Now, let me be clear, that doesn't mean that you now start counseling your workers. But if a worker does raise stress, and they often do it indirectly, the supervisor might talk to the worker about that and work out a referral. Perhaps there's somebody at the agency who provides counseling support for the worker, but you don't provide the support. Maybe an example will help. That comes from my teaching. So I had this class, and people are presenting their work with families. And one young woman presents an example, and I always require process recordings. I want some of the conversation. I think it's a mistake to have someone present in a class or in supervision of the overview of a family, the diagnosis of the family, the treatment outcome, all that stuff. They're all important, but in the end, if you're going to be helpful to someone in their work as a supervisor or a teacher, You need to know something about what the work looks like. So she's describing this session, and it becomes clear to the class that the dad has got an alcohol problem. And everyone in that family knows about it, but they're only getting at it indirectly. It's the family secret. So one of the students in the class raises their hand and says to the presenting student, look, I got a sense indirectly that they're really saying that their father drinks too much and that he has an alcohol problem. Did you pick that up? And the presenting student said, yes, I did. And then another student jumps in and says, well, is there any reason why you didn't raise that in the family session? And there's a very long pause in the class. And then the student says, it may have to do with the fact that my father was an alcoholic. And bam, starts to sob in the class. Now, I'm the teacher. This is an educational setting. I have to be clear about the purpose of the class and my role as a teacher. I have seen people in situations like that. What a wonderful opportunity. I'll turn this into a therapeutic encounter. And now the whole class will work on the problem she has with her alcoholic father. Huge mistake. If you do something like that, no one in the class will ever risk again. So being clear about my role and understanding the parallel process, what I say to her was, that must be very difficult for you right now, working with a family when it brings up so many of these feelings for you. Do you have anyone to talk to? At that point, she didn't. So I said, well, why don't you come after class? We can discuss it, and I can make a referral to the student services. I think it would be very helpful to you to talk to someone about what happens when your own feelings and issues come around the corner and hit you like a ton of bricks. Then I say to her, and here I'm trying to illustrate understanding the purpose of the class and understanding my role. I said, would it be helpful to you if right now the whole class focused on what you could do to help this family? Yes, please. I'm lost. I don't know what I'm doing. And now we have an absolutely excellent class, not discussing the student's problem with her father, but how do you deal with something when it comes around the corner and hits a ton of bricks? And that's every student in the class is experiencing that. If I wasn't clear about my role and what am I doing? I am modeling. That's the prior whole process. I'm modeling for this student and the whole class exactly the kind of role protection, purpose, clarity, and skills that are going to be needed in their practice. I hope that example helps a bit. As a part-time lecturer at Rutgers, I definitely will be helped by that example. Absolutely. And I think students understanding their role also helps them because I think that role clarification is very important and the core tasks that you're trying to do. Well, you have to respect boundaries, and that's one of the important things people learn. And this is what, sometimes what people get confused when they hear about the parallel process. Is the supervisor doing therapy for the worker? Absolutely not. But when a worker comes in who has dealt with a family with a kind of an acting out father and a lot of stress and comes in and describes the family interview and clearly is upset in the interview and sided with the kids by making critical comments about the father to the father. The supervisor, who then says, I'll just give you two versions. The supervisor, he says, well, don't you think you identified with the kids and cut yourself off from the father? How did he experience that? That supervisor is modeling the opposite of the parallel process. I want that supervisor to say to that worker, that must have been a very difficult moment for you. What were you feeling when you heard the dad being so angry with the kids? And that's the way I'm going to model and teach how to be with both the kids and the parents at exactly the same time. It's what I call the two clients. I'm going to teach that as a supervisor by doing it, by being with my worker and her clients 
at exactly the same time. I'm going to model for her. This is what I mean when I talk about Morse court and tort. When that supervisor criticizes the worker for being on the side of the kids versus the parents, they're modeling the opposite of what we want that worker to do. We want that worker to empathize with both. Dr. Shulman, do you think it is important for supervisors to set the tone for the supervisory relationship in the first session? Yes, but let me qualify that. Often that doesn't happen in the first session. And one of the principles of my work has always been at every level, practice, supervision, teaching, is that we all make mistakes for different reasons. And skill is really shortening the distance between when you make a mistake and when you catch it. So I have seen excellent supervisors in my workshops. I do a lot of workshops for supervisors, probably more even than for direct practitioners now these days. I have seen supervisors blow it in the first session, do some thinking about it, reflect on it, come back the second session, look, and say to their workers, I don't think I was as clear as I should have been in the first session about how I see us using this since we're new to each other. Give me another shot. Now, isn't that a wonderful modeling for what a worker might do with a client when the worker feels that they weren't clear in the first session? So what I'm trying to say is, I don't think we're perfect. I think we're impacted all the time by our own feelings, our own emotions, what's going on around us right now. My goodness, the impact of the virus on all of us is incredible. So yes, I think the first session is important. And I think the skills for supervision and practice The first session skills include clarifying purpose. I tried to do that in the example I gave about the student who had a father who was an alcoholic. Clarifying purpose about what is supervision all about. It isn't clinical therapy, but it is an opportunity to be helpful to workers as they struggle to deliver services to clients. Clarifying the role. What is the job of the supervisor? Again, not a clinician for the worker, but a sounding board, someone who can model and also teach in terms of helping workers look at their work and go back a second time and maybe correct issues in their work with clients. And I think also in the first session, getting feedback is important. In other words, as a supervisor in the first session, I would want to say something about what I think about what supervision is about, what my job is. And then I want to ask the worker, what is it that you'd like to get from me? And I think the contract, what I call the contract, is the overlap between what the worker is looking to get and what I'm there to offer. And that's true with a client as well. So again, in the first session of supervision, I'm modeling a good first session with a client. I also think you have to deal with other things in the first session, for example, a confidentiality. A worker with a family needs to spell out, say in child welfare, under what conditions they might have to report abuse. Uh, That ought to be clear right from the start so that it's no surprise later on. Well, what about a supervisor and a worker? Don't they have to be clear about under what conditions might they have to raise issues about the worker's performance? I think so. So in effect, the very first session, if you're going to handle it well with a new worker, for example, or as a new supervisor, in the very first session, you ought to be doing that. You ought to clarify purpose of supervision, what it is and what it isn't. You ought to clarify your job, your role, how you're going to help as a supervisor. You ought to get some feedback from your workers, just like they need to get feedback from the clients so they can find out what their area of urgency is. Well, for example, a new supervisor with a worker who has a lot of experience is going to want to find out at what level of understanding is that worker struggling with? Because those issues that that worker experiences could be very different from someone who just graduated from school of social work and it's their first job. They haven't had years of supervision. So that contracting is important. What I think sometimes gets left out is the last part, which is clarification around the limits, clarification around confidentiality, et cetera. I think people feel uncomfortable about their own authority as a supervisor, and therefore they duck that issue. But that comes back to haunt them later on if they don't deal with it. Now, again, Bridget, I want to be clear. Should that kind of stuff be dealt with in a first session? Yes. Will the worker understand what the supervisor said? Maybe not. There's so much going on. They may have to say it again. It may have to come up later on in a later session. There's no guarantee that when you speak the words, the words are heard, understood, and remembered. Right now, you and everyone who listens to this podcast may be hearing a different version of what I'm saying because they're bringing to the podcast a whole set of ideas, experiences, et cetera. So it's no guarantee that you've just said it in the first session, that they've heard it, understood it, and integrated. That's why you have to come back often in what I call recontracting. 
in my books on supervision and on practice, I have whole chapters now on recontracting. The assumption being it didn't get understood or clear in the beginning. And I have to tell you, I have seen supervisors in my workshops who've been supervising a staff member for months, having to go back right to the beginning because they never, ever did the clarification purpose role and the issues around confidentiality. So can you describe the core dynamics and skills that make up the relationship between supervisor and practitioner? In my research, these are the same skills, by the way, between practitioner and client. That's where the parallel process was so striking to me. The skills are the same. The purpose and the roles are different. But the key skill, and this is what I found interesting in my work, my research and my teaching and my consulting, is that one of the single most important skills in every level was the ability of the helping professional, whether as a social worker, a frontline worker, or a supervisor, to share his or her personal thoughts and feelings. Now, I want to stop for a second. Listen to what I just said. To share his or her personal thoughts and feelings. I don't know about you, Bridget, but when I went to school of social work, I was taught I was never to do that. Mm-hmm. That wasn't professional. We borrowed a model from medicine. And doctors at that time, it's changing, by the way. Doctors really are making major changes in their understanding of patient relationship. But at that time, that would be considered unprofessional. So one never did share your thoughts and feelings, honestly. So think about that for a second. And yet that becomes the most powerful predictor in every one of my studies of the working relationship. I call it the working relationship in a lot of the literature now. In practice, they call it the therapeutic alliance. Same thing. In mind, the three elements of the working relationship was rapport. For example, a supervisee would say, I get along with my supervisor. Trust. I can tell my supervisor anything on my mind. I can share my mistakes and failures as well as my successes. And caring. My supervisor cares as much about me as he or she cares about the clients. My supervisor is here to help me, not to just criticize me. So rapport, trust, and caring. Key elements. And what I did in my research, which I think was unique at the time, was I treated this issue of the relationship as a third variable, a mediating variable. And so that was the variable through which you as a supervisor influenced the outcomes with your worker. And on the next level, that was the variable in which you influenced the outcomes of a worker's practice with clients. Now, did it account for the whole thing? No, I'm getting a little statistical now, but I'll try to make it as simple as I can. A portion of the outcomes, what eventually happened, for example, did the client feel the worker was helpful? Does the worker feel the supervisor is helpful? A portion of that in my research analysis came from relationships. It was a big portion, however. So my argument has been that you really can't influence people, whether they're clients or workers, unless you first work on and continue to develop the kind of working relationship that allows rapport, trust, and caring. So you talk about contracting in the first session. Are there different phases of the supervisory relationship? Yes. I'm glad you asked that. Once again, the parallel process is, uh, is, is dynamite. I'll tell you, it's, it tells us so much about our work. The phases that I use are four. I call them the preliminary phase or preparatory phase, the beginning phase, which is when the contracting goes on, the middle or work phase, and the ending and transition phase. Let me acknowledge, by the way, that I borrow some of the work from my former friend and colleague, passed away a while back, William Schwartz. Bill was the professor at Columbia University School of Social Work, and I became a field instructor for them. And I took a course, and I lucked out, and I got Bill as the one who was teaching the course that I was taking. I learned a lot from Bill, sometimes painfully, because a lot of the stuff I had learned in schools of social work, he turned upside down. But one of the things Bill did was he talked about not just three phases, but the four phases of work. Now, the three phases had been developed at the University of Pennsylvania, folks who, who were called the Functional School of Social Work. Not even sure they teach that anymore. But the people at the University of Pennsylvania borrowed work that built on the work of Otto Rank, where schools of social work were very Freudian rather than Rankian. And one of the things that they said was that time had an impact on your practice with clients. And they talked about the beginning, middle, and ending phases. What Bill added was the preliminary or preparatory phase. So I see the phases of work as very crucial and helping to guide you if you're a supervisor or a worker 
For example, you have a new worker coming on to work at the agency. And they're coming on and say it's a child welfare agency, and they're coming on into a protection role. If I'm a supervisor, I think it might be helpful before my first session with that worker if I would use a skill I call tuning in. And tuning in is a skill of putting yourself in the shoes of the people you're working with and trying to develop a preliminary empathy, some understanding of what they may, can I underline may, may be thinking and feeling as they come onto the job. Why would I do that? I want to do that because I want to sensitize myself better so that when I hear the indirect communications that will come from that new worker, I'm able to respond directly to the indirect communication. So when I hear that little hesitant, that supervisor might be saying to that worker, I realize that you really care about these clients, but I think a little part of you must be worried about some of those situations. At least that's what I'm hearing where you may be dealing with a client who could be violent or threatening. The worker didn't say, I'm concerned about dealing with a client who was threatening. But if the supervisors tuned into that as an issue for new child welfare workers in the protection area, they may hear it, even though it was raised indirectly. That's just one example. The same is true with the client. I'll use child welfare because that's one of the areas I'm most interested in. The first session, when a worker arrives at the door and knocks on the door and says, and the example I have in the book, and says, I'm so-and-so from Children's Services, and the client says to them at the door, get the hell out of here, we're not interested in Children's Services. A worker who's tuned in might, instead of getting into an argument or immediately calling the police, might say to that potential client, I just want to make it clear, I'm not here to try to take away your kids. We've got enough kids already. What I'm here to do is to try to see if there's some way I can be helpful to you and your family as well as your child. You understand what that direct response was? It read the underlying communication and responded to that and started to offer a role of a social worker that may be quite different from what that family thought or heard from other families of what workers were all about. So I think the the tuning in phase is really crucial. Whenever I started a new group, I always did it myself. One of the groups I had when I was teaching at Boston University was people with AIDS who were in early substance abuse recovery. This was early in the AIDS epidemic, and it was before we really had treatments. And it was held at the AIDS Action Center in Boston. And my policy as an academic, in order to keep myself real, was every year to take a different kind of group. So the group I organized that year with a co-leader were a group of people with AIDS who were in substance abuse recovery. In my opening session, I had to make a statement of the purpose of the session and why we were meeting. We actually met for a whole year. I documented that. There's some process recordings in my book from those sessions. So I felt at the very beginning, I had to be very clear about what we were about. And I made what I call an opening statement based on my tuning in. I said, all of you are struggling at times with your recovery. And you're going to agencies and going to groups to talk about recovery and how to help you maintain it. All of you also are struggling with AIDS, and you're also going to groups to talk about the AIDS. This group's a little different. What we're interested is in how AIDS is affecting your recovery and how your recovery is impacting your AIDS. That was my opening statement. And I said to them at that point, and my role and my co-leader's role, we're here to help you help each other because we think you have an awful lot you can give, if nothing else, support, since you're struggling with the same issues. Now, was it important for me to have a tuned-in opening statement like that? I think so, because I think that gave the clients a clear idea of what the struggle is. I think that sometimes if you don't address the preliminary phase, you might not get to the beginning, middle, and ending phase. You might lose the client, or you might lose the attention of the group. What do you think about that? Of course, sure, because your first session is important. The question on the minds, let's say in group work, but it could be just as well family work or individual work. But since I gave a group example, the question on their minds first and foremost is always, who is this social worker and what is he or she all about? Number one, that's that number one question. Second question is, what's this group all about? What are we going to be doing? The third question is, in group work, who are these other people in the room? and how I'm going to relate to them. The first question I refer to as the authority theme, and I think that has to be dealt with right at the beginning, because if it isn't, people get stuck on the authority theme. Third question I refer to as the intimacy theme. 
who are the people in the group and how am I going to relate to them? If you don't tune in and you just start a session, you're going to miss all the indirect communications that clients use to speak to us. For example, I just did a little session for students who are starting support groups for other students who are struggling a little bit in the field because of the impact of the virus on their field work, supervision, and education. And we did some work on that. And one of the things that came up was the issue of silence. So that you make an opening statement, you're clear, you do all the stuff that you think you're supposed to be doing, and you're greeted with silence. And I joked and I said, I think the usual emotional reaction of the worker at that point is to say to themselves, why didn't I bring a film or something? (laughs) I said, that's because they don't know what's inside the silence. And the silence is as loud a communication as words. And what did these students, I was doing a workshop for students who were going to be leading groups. So what did they think might be inside silences? How about thinking? (laughs) How about (laughs) feeling? How about saying to themselves, so this is what it's all about? So I said, waiting for a silence is helpful, although I wouldn't do the old psychotherapy trick of staying silent for the entire session, which I think raises another whole set of issues. But what about reaching inside the silence? Instead of jumping in, what if the worker jumped in and said, does this sound like your experience? Is this making sense? Are some of these problems the kinds of problems you guys, are you thinking about it right now? Is this hitting you hard? I just threw out six different versions of what might be inside the silence based on my tuning in. And when the workers, when the clients or workers, because this is just as true in a workers group, when they hear the kinds of things that I'm saying, that opens up the conversation. So when you get a silence, you don't change the subject because you think you're off base. The silence may mean you're on base. You are exactly on base. It's your anxiety that causes you to react to the silence. So, yeah, I think it's important that this stuff gets dealt with right in the first session. And as the worker does that or the supervisor does that with a workup, they're strengthening this thing I call working relationship, which is going to make it easier for people to risk with them and to take help from them. And I think it's a new type of relationship. A practitioner may not even know how to be in that relationship. And sometimes we have to sort of help them with giving them words or or noticing the process that's going on in between the practitioner and the supervisor right there in the room. That's what you're talking about, I think. Yes, but I think you just said something very important. I don't want to lose it. When you said sometimes giving them the words, you said that. I'm actually quoting you. I yes, remember I know. you said that. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> you know. Told, yeah, you but I, I want that to us. elaborate on that. <laughs> you know, I want to elaborate on that because I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Sometimes clients and workers and students have a hard time finding the words themselves, so I might be helping them. But I've had classes where we role play a a therapeutic experience, and one student role plays being the group leader, for example, and they'll make some comments to the group, and another student will stop and say, hey, you you know, you sound just like Shulman, Brooklyn accent and all. (laughs) What's clear is they have borrowed my words. And I will say to them at that point, as a supervisor or teacher, I'll say, that's okay. At this point, if you want to use my words, go right ahead. But it's important that you're feeling the emotions underneath those words. I said, as you get more comfortable, you'll find your own words. And so, yeah, I I got used to the idea that sometimes students sounded just like me because they hadn't in their life, their personal lives, their family lives, they hadn't learned to articulate emotions. And I was asking them, and the field was asking them to learn how to do that. So they want to borrow my words, borrow my words. But you better feel something underneath it. That was the key, not the words themselves. So anyway, that just triggered that response to me. That is such an important concept. Thank you for that. Social workers learn from hearing feedback. They also learn from watching their supervisors practice. Which one do you think is more important? Let me say that you're not going to get any learning unless you are modeling. So you'd have to say at the beginning, the supervisor has to model what he or she is preaching or teaching, period. If you're not modeling it, then they're not getting it. I don't care what words you use or how you give them feedback on their practice. A couple of the examples I've already given you where a supervisor might be modeling the opposite of what they're asking the worker to do with clients. So the feedback is meaningless because the supervisor hasn't modeled it. And workers, as well as clients, are very good at figuring that out. A worker in a family session, 
who's asking a parent, for example, to deal with some empathy with a difficult kid, if that worker isn't empathizing with that parent at the very moment they're asking them to do it, what I call making a demand for work, confronting a client or confronting a worker and asking them to say or do something that's difficult. If that worker is doing the demand for work but hasn't developed the relationship or doesn't infuse that with empathy, for example, I know it would be hard at a moment like that for you to really stop and confront your son with what he said. If that worker is just saying, I think it's important for you to confront your worker with what he just said, it's the integration of empathy and confrontation that makes it a skill. It's one of the many. What it does actually, this discussion right at this moment, leads me to another major, major issue, which I just want to comment on. I think many of the problems we face in supervision and practice are the result of false dichotomies. In our minds, somehow, we have separated two things that really need to be integrated. So in the examples we're just discussing, I think it's very important for a supervisor or a worker to confront and make demands on a worker or a client after the relationship has been built, by the way, because I think premature demands aren't very helpful. But even as one makes a confrontation or a demand, you have to be supportive at the same time. And I've seen supervisors and frontline workers go back and forth. They're supportive, they're understanding, the client doesn't respond, then they get angry and now they're confronting and then the client gets turned off. So now they get supportive, they go back and forth between support and confrontation when actually the skill involves integrating the two. The other false dichotomy is processing content. We've been talking about that for this whole conversation. What I'm saying in effect is you can't separate the two, that the process, the process has to model the content. You can't say one thing while you're modeling just the opposite. And as I've given in a number of examples, sometimes the process is telling you something about the content. And so I'm always looking at the connection. This is why, by the way, I reject the whole group work modeling that's done in schools sometimes now, maybe more than sometimes, where you have an encounter group. People get together and they talk about the process, but there's no other content. I was trained in that for my doctorate, by the way, at Temple University in group dynamics and stuff. But I think a lot of those things are a waste of time. So yeah, I want to deal with process, but I want to deal with it in terms of its connection to the content of the work. So process content, the individual with the group, that's another false dichotomy. I think I've addressed a little bit in some of the examples. Structure versus freedom. I think in supervision and in practice, you have to create a structure. That's what contracting is all about. And a good structure creates freedom. No structure, there's no freedom. When you start a client or a supervision session and you're simply saying, oh, what do you want to talk about? There's no structure. So I have to do a little structure. That's what contracting is. And good structure creates freedom. And that's where the feedback comes back from either the client or the worker that you're dealing with. We've really been talking about what I would call Larry Schulman's list of false dichotomies and phony dualisms. And of course, if I said that at the beginning, that would be the end of the podcast. (laughs) But that's really what this is about. How do we integrate what appears to be separate things, content versus process, support versus confrontation, the individual versus the group? So are there any challenges or issues that may arise when working with the parallel process? Why would you think a supervisor may be uncomfortable with making demands for work? There might be something the supervisor could learn from. Well, it's not just supervisors, workers also. Demand for work is a confrontation. I'm looking for facilitative confrontations. That's a confrontation that facilitates the work rather than closes it all. I could understand a use of authority on the part of a super. Let's take the supervision example. The use of authority can be uncomfortable. Let's say a new supervisor wants to be liked, wants the staff to think positively of them, and may put off making a confrontation for a period of time when they should, early in the supervisory relationship, confront a worker. One of the examples in my supervision book, which hopefully is going to be out by the end of October, I got my fingers crossed, the fourth edition. One of the examples I have is working with a a new supervisor, working with a difficult staff member who's been around for a while. And what becomes apparent to the new supervisor is that this staff member and most of the staff members haven't really been supervised by the previous supervisor. No demands were made on them. There were no real conversations about their work with clients. They were allowed to get away with murder. 
And so the supervisor puts off week after week confronting this particular worker who is supposed to be coming into conferences, bringing some process recording and raising issues and stuff like that, and isn't doing it. Is coming in and, in effect, wants to participate in what I have called the illusion of work, because that's how it worked with the previous supervisor. It takes a while, and it took a presentation of this example at one of my workshops for the supervisor to realize that he wasn't helping this worker by ducking the issue. If he wanted to help the worker, the only chance he had was really by confronting the worker, but doing it with some level of support. So he goes back in the next session, stops the worker and confronts him about what he's doing, that he's evading the work. uh, And the worker gets very angry and says, the previous supervisor never complained about me. And the supervisor has to say, well, I think that was the problem. They never complained about you, but they didn't give you any feedback either. So that's a confrontation. And I think in every area of our lives, personal as well as professional, confrontation is difficult. But what I have learned in my work is that confrontation is part of the helping process. If it's done skillfully, and if it's done with investing of caring and support. When you confront someone because you care about them, how many of the people are sitting right now with parents? You have to confront your kids. Part of growing up is to set limits. If you don't set limits, you're not helping them. But when you set limits on them, you want simultaneously to also be caring and loving and to communicate to them at the same time. So, yeah, I think people duck confrontation. They don't want to be seen as angry. And that's what happens. That's where you separate the confrontation and the support because they are angry. They're angry because the worker is not responding. And the anger comes across in a different way than it would in a facilitative confrontation. So I think we hesitate. Workers do the same. Workers hesitate confronting clients. I have wonderful examples in skills I help in where a teenage client is evading work, missing appointments calling and constantly raising issues, even though she's court mandated and isn't coming. And the worker keeps ducking it. And that worker isn't helping that client. The real help begins when the worker confronts the client and says to the client, you can't keep this up. If you keep this up, I'm going to report you to the court because you're not meeting the requirements of your being on probation. Now, that's a pretty strong confrontation. But if you care about this teenager and you want the teenager to do something about their lives, you can't just keep going with this dance, this illusion of work, accepting all of her evasions. You have to confront her. And in the example I'm discussing right now, after that, the next week, the client comes in on time and she's ready to work. The confrontation was helpful, not hurtful. And so supervisors and workers have to learn through experience That confrontation is not always negative. That's sometimes just one of the most important things you can do in work with your supervisees or in work with your clients. And I think supervisees feel more safe and more contained when their supervisors take on the role of that authority. It creates a dynamic, I think, that's positive, like you mentioned, in supervision. What it means is the supervisor cares about the worker. Mm -hmm. You don't confront people if you don't care about them. We're talking about our personal lives, not just our professional lives. If you care about someone, you have to confront them. Hopefully, you've learned to do it in a way that integrates the confrontation with support. So you're not in that false dichotomy issue. I'm suggesting when you say, do I confront versus do I support? It's a false dichotomy. Confrontation, in many cases, as a supervisor or a frontline worker, is support. It's not two different things. All of a sudden, the false dichotomy disappears when you realize that confrontation sometimes is the most supportive thing you can do for a worker or a client. Do you think a supervisor should be open to hearing both positive and negative feedback from a practitioner under their supervision? Not only should they be, they have to be. And you have to work very hard to do that. In other words, remember I talked earlier about the authority theme, the relationship between the person with external authority, that's the supervisor, and the worker. And again, the parallel process would apply to work with clients as well. The supervisor has to say right at the beginning, I think as part of contracting that you may not always agree with me and I hope you'll feel free to let me know when you don't. Or sometimes I may make decisions that you may not be happy about, you get angry at. Okay, it's going to happen. Please feel free to let me know so we can talk about it. Supervisor can say all of those things. And if you think the worker is going to take up their offer right away, you're wrong. 
the supervisor is going to have to work very hard to create the conditions where workers do feel safe to confront the supervisor, do feel safe to disagree, do feel safe to be angry over those things. In other words, it isn't an issue of should they or shouldn't they hear both sides. They got to work their tail off to make sure they create the kind of relationship with staff. And again, the parallels with clients where they hear both sides, where workers feel free to say to their supervisors, I was thinking about our conference yesterday, and actually I got pretty upset when you said that about that client. Great that the worker said that. What I want a supervisor to say at that moment, why did you tell me that yesterday? Well, I I wasn't sure you were going to hear me. Well, okay, that's fine. I'm glad you did it today. But in the future, when you're sitting there feeling that, when I'm saying something about your work with a client, say it as soon as you can. It's important for me to hear what you're thinking and feeling as we work. In a classroom, when I start a class, I had a class, one of my University of Pennsylvania practice classes, turns out because of the enrollment issues, I don't know how to describe it, but they were all women in my class, no men. Usually I had at least a couple of men in the class. Oh, I tell the students in the very first class, I say, it's going to be very important for you to let me know what you think about what I'm sharing. And I acknowledge the gender issue in the first class. I say, also, this is one of the few classes where the instructor, the person in positions of authority, in this case, me, is male, and all of the students are female. So sometimes the issue of gender could come up and could be an issue, and I hope you feel free to raise it if it does. Well, of course, they don't believe me. (laughs) It's just because I said that. About four or five classes into the class, a student's presenting work with a convict who's considering being considered for parole. And that convict's coming on to the student sexually in the work. And I intervene and talk about tuning in about what is that convict saying to the student in the work. I'm trying to get them to think a little bit about how this sexual behavior is sending a message, but also how to respond to it. And as I'm saying that, one of the members of the class, what I call an internal leader, looks at me and says, How the hell would you understand what it's like for us? Do you understand what that moment is? That moment is them finally taking me up on the thing I said I would be open to at the very beginning, but they don't trust because they may never have had an instructor who have said that and meant that. And I had a pullback and I said, well, you know, I think you're right. I don't think I could fully understand what it might be like for you, Jane, as a woman in an experience with a guy coming on like that, I guess the rest of you guys in the class are going to have to help her. And I'm going to sit back and let you do it. Do you understand what I just did? Yes. I worked. I said it at the beginning. They didn't believe me. They've had people who said things like that. And the first time they said a comment to a supervisor or to a teacher, they got their heads shut off. So why should they believe me when I said it at the beginning? They needed to see it in action, in a highly emotional moment, which I was. And after that, they began to believe me. So was I modeling? Yes, you damn straight I was modeling. I was modeling how hard it is to get people to give you both positive and negative feedback. So just saying you want it is not enough. It's creating a culture of feedback being allowed. You just put your finger on the right word, the crucial word, which is culture. What is culture? Okay, well, the culture in a relationship, a supervisory relationship, the culture in a family, the first culture of the group, in most cases, they consist of norms of behavior, taboos, things that we've learned not to say or not to do, different roles that people play. For example, the one I just gave you right now, the taboo was against confronting the male instructor in an all-female class around his lack of ability to understand what it was like. If you were a woman in a situation like that, that was a taboo issue. They may have actually experienced other classes where they were invited, and then the instructor immediately turned it down. So when I teach or when I practice or when I supervise, my first issue is how do I change the culture in the system? Because we've been raised in a culture where we don't talk about taboo subjects, where the norms are to be polite, not to confront. And that student who confronted me and said, how the hell do you understand? That's an internal leader. She's my ally because she is moving that class into another level where the culture is supportive of effective work rather than you have a culture which supports an illusion of work. And I should say something about that. I've used that phrase twice. The greatest single danger to effective supervision practice or teaching 
is the ability of people to create an illusion of work, to pretend that something real is happening and it isn't. And so confronting the illusion of work is the way we begin to change the culture. And once the culture changes, then people feel more free to risk. Now, they may not be able to do it in the class they take right after my class, but at least in my class, we're going to establish a culture where you say what you think and feel. You don't say what you think the instructor wants to hear. That's a major change in the culture. Yes, and by you backing down and showing some humility in that moment, you allowed mastery to pop up from your student. Your student became the master and it created a space for something new to happen. And they were very good in that particular example. They were very good in two things. They were very good in empathizing and understand how it felt for the student to be sitting there with the convict and having him come on to her that way, her client, and very good in understanding why it was tough for her to confront him. And then very good in role-playing with her about how in her next session, she wouldn't let him get away with that bullshit. And that really helping him was confronting him. This was the way he treated women, period. This is why he was in prison for many reasons. The client also gets to benefit. You got it. The transformation. <laughs> hey, parallel process, right? Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, we social workers are on the front lines of dealing with some very tricky and complicated and, and complex issues all the time. Like this is something that we have to be able to talk about. So is there anything I didn't ask you about the parallel process that you think is important for us to know about? Well, I'll just make one more comment, and, and I'm not sure if it's directly on target, but I don't like to have a conversation like this without mentioning it. I'm a big believer in the historical roots of our profession, social work. My history was going back to Mary Richmond, a charity organization society a long time ago, and Jane Adams, the, the Settlement House movement a long time ago. And one interested in healing individual hurts, that was that would be Mary Richmond and the Charity Organization Society. I'm just using her as a symbol. I mean, it was broader than that. And the other interested in social change, that was the Settlement House movement. And as a profession, and sometime probably the 30s, we started to integrate the two. Why am I raising that? Well, right now we're being flooded with, quote, evidence-based practice. You even talked about it at the beginning of the session about evidence-based practice. I think you did anyway. And cognitive behavioral therapy and solution focus therapy and motivational interviewing therapy. My objection is not to, uh, those models. In fact, there are ideas that I can take my, in my current textbook. I describe those and other evidence-based or practices or evidence-informed practices like, like crisis therapy, et cetera. And I take from them the ideas that I like, but I integrate it into a social work model. In other words, I don't want to become, as some people call themselves, a cognitive behavioral therapist. Well, I'll put it to you this way. When I was dean, I used to give graduating speech to my class, my students who were graduating in school of social work was at University of Buffalo. All the parents are there, the students are there. And one of the things I said in my speech is, when your mom or dad asks you, what do you do, like mine did, I have a little joke about parents always asking, what do you do and how do you answer that? I said, if you tell them you're a cognitive behavioral therapist, or you tell them you're a solution-focused therapist, or you tell them you're a whatever therapist, I will figure that we actually have failed in our work with you as social workers. I said, the only thing that I'm going to accept is when you tell, oh my gosh, I still get emotional. You tell your parents you're a social worker, and you're proud of it. Understand what I'm saying to my students? I, do. I want them to remember the roots so in all the examples we had just now, every single example I gave, in addition to a clinical practice issue and that, or a supervision issue, there was also the issue of social change. And I don't believe you can be an effective social worker if you're just dealing with clinical practice and you've just become a clinical person who does motivational interviewing. I think you have to be a person who takes a look at what's going on in the agency, what's going on in the community. And if you're a real social worker, in my view, you are just as active in social change. And let me tell you, right now, with what's going on in this country, right before our eyes, the scariest thing I've ever seen in the history, my history, uh, living in the United States, every single social worker has to remember our roots. And that we're going to have to work hard, not just to, to heal the individual hurts, but also to work to try to make social change. And it's going to become even more important, I think, in the next months. So I just wanted to get that in. What the hell? 
I thought this was an opportunity. I appreciate that. And I think that social work and social work training, the kind of training that you do, is exactly the work that this world needs right now. We are the right people for the right time. You got it. Dr. Shulman, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to social work and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand parallel process and supervision. Well, thank you, Bridget. I think putting on these broadcasts are important. As my 18-year-old grandson says, I really do not understand what retirement is all about. So I find it a pleasure <laughs> to get this time. We're grateful that you're not retiring <laughs> completely. <laughs> Be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health, including a section on social work and a page dedicated to Dr. Shulman's work. There you will also find how to submit any questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or questions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so that you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.